let me play devil's advocate one more time. And you know, the the other argument to vaccines is people will say, um, look, if you don't believe in them, look at polio. They always go back, it seems, to polio, and then they'll say, well, these people are just being crazy. But keep your unvaccinated kid away from mine at school for fear of, I don't know, if you're unvaccinated, apparently you bring more germs in. I don't really understand that. But what do you think of those those arguments? Well, there's a couple of topics there. Let's say polio is one and um, and this idea that keep your unvaccinated children away from from my my, uh, you know, from, from par parents don't want their vaccinated children to be exposed to unvaccinated children. Well, I used to tell people all the time, how can how can you know, if, if, if your child is vaccinated, how can an unvaccinated child put your child at risk if the vaccine is effective? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's really just a, another way for them to be admi admitting that they don't really trust the vaccine. It's a great selling point. I mean, imagine somebody developing, imagine a group of chiropractors or a group of naturopaths developing a, a vitamin. And they said, here's a vitamin and I'm gonna give it to you and it's gonna make you healthy. But if your neighbors don't also take it to make them healthy, it's not gonna work in you, okay? What a great selling point. It's an argument for, for, you know, for, for mandatory vitamins or for mandatory vaccines or for a mandatory product, a mandatory market, uh, a mandatory market which who, who to develops a product and wouldn't wouldn't want a, a, a mandatory market with a with a great selling point like that. Um, but I'll tell you something. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't really work that way. For example, if you look at uh, pertussis, whooping cough, and for for many years they've been giving a whooping cough vaccine, and they're telling us that parents are being selfish if they don't vaccinate their kids because they're saying you have a social obligation: vaccinate your kids to protect other children against the disease. Well, here's what's actually happening with the pertussis vaccine, is they found that the microorganism that causes whooping cough, Bordetella pertussis, has mutated away from the vaccine. So the reason that, that pertussis or whooping cough is still occurring in society is not because there's too many people that are unvaccinated, but because the vaccine is no longer effective against the mutated strain. And I give it an analogy. When the United States goes overseas and says, we're gonna go fight the Taliban, or we're gonna fight some terrorist group, and they go into Afghanistan and they take them out. Okay, that's like a vaccine that keeps attacking. Every time you give a child a, a, a pertussis vaccine, you're, you're, you're attacking Bordetella pertussis. That's like the terrorist group, okay, causing, causing harm. Well, what happens when the United States takes that, takes that, uh, that uh, terrorist group out, they create a vacuum and another group comes in. And that's, that's sort of like what happens with the mutations, okay? It mutates away from what it was and becomes something different. And, and that's what happened with, with, with the, the Bordetella pertussis. Uh, so, so the vaccine is no longer effective because it has uh, the, 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 board, the, the microorganism responsible for whooping cough has, has moved away. And, and the new moved away from, from the, the vaccine, it's, it's called evolutionary adaptation. It's s s selective adaptation. And, and, and it, it, it's a way that it's found to adapt to its environment. It wants to survive. And a microorganism doesn't want to kill its host, but it does need to overcome all of its enemies. And so it becomes more virulent. So the pertussis, the new strain of pertussis that's mutated away from the vaccine, it's now not only more prevalent, but it's more virulent. Okay, the toxin that it produces is 1.62 times the original toxin before the vaccine came along. And, and, the vaccine is not very effective. So when you have vaccinated children, each of these children that, that's vaccinated is actually a laboratory for the creation 
or the development of a more virulent strain. And then what happens is you have the original strain, the vaccine comes along and attacks Bordetella pertussis. The strain evolves away from the vaccine and becomes more virulent. And now you've got the two strains, the original strain and the more virulent strain. And originally the more virulent strain was created in the, uh, in the vaccinated child. Because in the non-vaccinated child, the, those, those boarded telepertussis are evolving to become less virulent because they don't want to, they don't want to kill their host, okay? So, so what's happening in, in the, in the non-vaccinated child, boarded telepertussis is evolving to become less virulent. In the vaccinated child, boarded telepertussis is evolving to become more virulent because it has to overcome the vaccine to, 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 to stay alive. And now they're all circulating and they're mixing in both vaccinated and unvaccinated populations. And that's, that's the, the situation that we have today. So it's really, from my perspective, I don't want the vaccinated children coming near my unvaccinated children. It's the opposite way. As far as uh, polio is concerned, um, that's an argument that a lot of people make that they, they believe that, uh, that uh, the polio vaccine was responsible for, um, for stopping the, the polio from, from spreading. But there's a lot of good evidence, and I, I discussed that evidence in the vaccine safety manual. I've got a chapter on the polio vaccine. I've got a chapter on all the vaccines, actually. And, and in that chapter, there's a lot of evidence showing that there was a lot of game playing that was taking place. At the time that they came out with the polio vaccine, they changed the legal definition of polio. They made it harder to diagnose cases of polio. And that alone was responsible for lowering the incidence of, of reportable cases of polio. So it, it made the vaccine seem more effective than it really was. And that was just one example uh, that that's taken place. There's other uh, conditions called aseptic meningitis. At the time, at the time, there was everything that looked like polio was labeled as polio. After the polio vaccine came out, they split it into two groups. Now it was polio and aseptic meningitis. So that if you look, you would see that cases of Polio went down, but cases of aseptic meningitis in increased. Um, um, but, but look, I'll, I'll say this. I do believe that vaccines can be shown to lower the incidence of some cases of disease. I know for a fact that there were thousands of cases of measles before the measles vaccine was introduced in 1963, and it reduced the cases of measles. I know that the chickenpox vaccine was introduced in 1995, and there were thousands, millions of cases every year, okay, and uh, of, of chickenpox, and the chickenpox vaccine reduced the cases of chickenpox circulating in society, but that's only one metric. That's only one measure of whether a vaccine can be determined to be effective or valuable in society. For example, the chickenpox vaccine also increased cases of shingles. We have, a sh we have an epidemic of shingles, and that's a whole other story. That's a whole other story uh, uh, as to how that t took place. Um, but but the, the success of the chickenpox vaccine is actually responsible for the increased uh, epidemic of shingles. And the same with measles. The measles Measles, I, I summarize several studies in this book that show that when you catch measles as a child, you are protected in later life against various types of cancer. And I show that there's a large Japanese study that just came out that, that, uh, that Kubata was the lead researcher. And he and his colleagues found, they, they, they looked at over 100,000 men and women, adults, they followed them for several years, and they discovered that women, men and women who contracted measles in childhood and mumps in childhood were statistically significantly protected against 
heart disease, and strokes in later life. So the point I'm making is that the measles vaccine was pretty effective at reducing cases of measles, but it is responsible for preventing people from gaining that protection against cancers, heart disease, and strokes in later life. People that catch those diseases in childhood are actually less likely to develop cancer, heart disease, and strokes. So there's a trade-off, and you have to weigh all of that when you're weighing the pros and cons of each individual vaccine.